Welcome to the Trainers Bullpen. This is where trainers in the law enforcement space come to hear the experts talk about their work, experience, and research into human performance, particularly as it relates to the critical aspects of training motor learning and adaptive decision making. The purpose of the Trainers Bullpen is to help bridge the gap between law enforcement training and the findings of academic research and current pedagogical best practice. Our desire here at the Trainers Bullpen is to help advance law enforcement training to make research applied and improve officer and public safety. The Trainers Bullpen is a production of Raptor Protection, and I'm Chris Butler, your host. And today, it's my pleasure to welcome to the show Dr. Jonathan Wender. Dr. Wender is co-founder and CEO of Polis Solutions. He's a 20-year police veteran and interdisciplinary social scientist whose area of expertise is face-to-face interactions in critical situations where risk is high and trust is low. Jonathan has a broad experience developing and implementing large-scale technology, training, and technical assistance programs designed to improve both officer and public safety. He's the lead developer of Polis's T3, that's TACT, Tactics, and Trust, and ADAPT training programs, and is currently directing Polis's efforts to build tools that integrate natural language processing and computer vision to automate the analysis of body-worn camera data. Jonathan previously served on the faculty of the University of Washington in the Department of Sociology and Law, Societies, and Justice program. He is internationally recognized as a subject matter expert on police reform, use of force, officer decision-making, police training, and other related topics. He holds a PhD in criminology from Simon Fraser University. Well, Dr. Wender, thanks so much for taking the time to join us on the Trainer's Bullpen today. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and thank you for the important work you're doing for the profession. Well, absolutely. And so... um, you know what, maybe before we get started, you could tell us a little bit about Polis Solutions to begin with. What is Polis and what's your mission there? So we are a company founded out of a large project that began at DARP at the Defense Advanced Research uh, Pro- Projects Agency. And uh, we had the, the mission at DARPA of developing science-based technology and training programs that would help military and police personnel manage high risk, low trust interactions, right? How do we improve trust? How do we improve outcomes in mission critical environments? When Polis's other co-founder, Brian Landy and I left DARP in 2014, we co-founded Polis with the purpose of continuing the work that we began at DARPA. Uh, So Polis has grown to become an organization that integrates data analytics, technology, and social science research to create training programs and technologies that help police departments and other organizations improve performance at scale and face-to-face interactions and also on a larger scale. Uh, We work primarily with the U.S. federal government as well as with police agencies of all sizes. So you mentioned, uh, so in your bio and also in your explanation there, you mentioned this word trust uh, and its relationship between trust and safety and, and safety is trust. Can you expand on that, uh, Dr. Winder? What, what's the importance of trust in, in police work in North America? Sure. So Chris, in, in any human relationship, trust is the alpha and the omega, right? Trust is what makes or breaks human relationships of every kind. Uh, it's safe to say you wouldn't have invited me onto this show if you didn't trust that I had something valuable to contribute. So it, policing uh, and politics have the same root word, which is polis. Uh, polis is the, is the ancient Greek word for a city state. And the outcomes of policing are never just technical. They ultimately come down to trust. So when we think about measures of effectiveness in policing, it's not just have we enforced the law, have we done things in a tactically appropriate way, but the ultimate question we need to ask is, have we improved trust? And we know when trust increases, safety increases. Conversely, when safety is diminished, trust goes down as well. Uh, and this applies not just physically, but emotionally. You can think of a, of a human relationship. You can think about organizational politics when officers feel Uh, that they are trusted by their leadership, that they are trusted by the community they've sworn to serve, they will work more effectively. Their morale will increase. Uh, And likewise, in in a community, when people trust in the police, when they trust in their fellow human beings, fellow community members, there's less crime and less violence. 
So the essence of Polis's work is to tackle this equation from both sides, to build safety by building trust and to build trust by building safety. And that's really what the, the idea of T3 exemplifies. It's teaching officers not just to be sound decision makers, not just to act in a safe and lawful way, but to act with a constant attention to how their smallest actions, words, gestures have strategic implications for community trust. Right? So we tell officers every interaction you have is setting conditions for the next officer's success. Right. And I guess ultimately, so that could be looked at at multiple levels, right? At the officer level to be successful on the street, but also more at a socio social level between law enforcement and the communities is for an agency to be successful and well, for society to be successful, that trust has to be there. I once had a senior police leadership early on in my career talk talk about that and and he said he used the bank account terminology and he said we're we always have to be putting trust into our bank account because the day will come when you need to make a withdrawal and if that commodity is not there you know and so do you, do you think that that's like that's an important perspective for for officers to have at every level of the organization I think it's absolutely, that's absolutely crucial. Uh, the the strength or weakness of trust is ultimately what drives the success of police agencies. And it's also critical for instructors and for police officers of all ranks, especially senior leaders, to understand the relationship between what we call internal and external procedural justice. More simply put, the way that officers are treated by their leadership fundamentally impacts how they treat the community. Uh, we, if we treat officers with dignity and respect, if we affirm their humanity, if we build trust in them, they are far more likely to go out and treat community members with respect and dignity. Uh, but when there's a misalignment between those, the results are quite predictable. And you know, quite frankly, when we look at the crisis in staffing in police agencies across North America, when we look at the, the crisis in public confidence to police, all of this comes down to a, a crisis of, of trust. And so the, the more systematically we can remedy that mistrust, the better off society and policing will be. Now, what does the, the relationship between the training environment and that trust have? Like, because I'm thinking of, for example, some academies that are still very much in, uh, and I, I'll use the word, I'll put my cards on the table here, the draconian type of military type of police academy where officers are not allowed to speak, they're punished for making mistakes, and and uh, they don't have an opinion unless they're told what their opinion is. And then we expect them post-graduation to go out on the street after six months of, of being exposed to that environment and then treat the citizens with openness, transparency, trust, fairness. What what What's your perspective on that? There's no doubt that police officers need a certain degree of structure and regimentation and discipline in their training and education. However, there is a big difference between what I just described and what I call sort of the boot camp light of a lot of police training, where you see police organizations try to imitate this ridic ridiculous Hollywood parody of what military training is or may have been you know, 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, and I think that a lot of police organizations miss the boat in taking from military training what is uh, shown by evidence and research to be most effective and what isn't. Uh, if we are trying to create officers who are ethical, adaptive problem solvers, we are not going to instill those capacities by berating and demeaning and belittling people or by constraining them with guidelines and sort of a paint by numbers approach that's antithetical to what I think good policing could and should be. Uh, and, and to be fair, and I, I was actually having a, a couple of conversations recently about this, I think one of the dangers we're seeing in police training today, while we certainly don't want that militaristic boot camp light approach, nor do we want an entirely unstructured environment which has no discipline and no respect. Um, I'm hearing many concerning things from across the US about the erosion of discipline and respect in police training environments. Uh, academy recruits who talk back to instructors, who sit and look at their phones, who uh, are acting in a manner, frankly, that I think is more common among middle school kids than it should be among aspiring police professionals. So uh, looking as in all things in life for that golden mean, I think is critical. And I know I'm, uh, I know you, you have similar opinions about this. Right. 
Right. Absolutely. So since we introduced the idea of, of training, uh, Jonathan, what, what do you feel like in your review through Polis and the ADAPT report, what do you feel is currently the strength of police training in the USA? Let's start with the strength and then we'll look at areas where you think there's room for improvement. So police training in the U.S. benefits from the fact that we have here the largest population of, of police officers on the planet Earth. We have an amazing breadth and diversity of professionals who bring to the table all kinds of talent. And I think American policing has the luxury of being able to marshal all that talent. We also have in the U.S. very close relationships between police agencies and universities and research institutions. So at its best, American policing can bring together and integrate a wide range of operational and academic perspectives to really advance the state of the art in policing. Um, that's where I think our, our greatest strength lies. Our greatest weakness lies in the dispersed, unfederated nature of American policing. Um, as you know, compared to most of the Europe, uh, most European countries or Canada, policing in the United States uh, devolves to 18,000 different organizations. Some of them are very large and well-funded. The majority are tiny. So we have a, a vast disparity in the U.S. between the quality and quantity of police training and education. And uh, that leads, of course, to vast disparities in performance on the street. And I would, I would love to see greater unity and consistency in how American police training is developed and delivered. Um, that may be a pipe dream beyond a certain level, but I do think there is improvement that's within reach. And uh, when you say more consistency, I, I'm assuming you're meaning not only consistency in content to a certain degree, but perhaps more importantly, consistency in methodology and how our officers are actually trained from more of a research-based perspective. Is that what you're getting at with consistency? Exactly right, and and in the U.S., just you know, very briefly for the for the benefit of folks who may not be familiar with the American policing system, we've got here some you know, very large agencies that serve cities like New York, L.A., Chicago, Dallas, where I live, and so on. And then we have thousands and thousands of tiny agencies. What folks may not know is that a majority of U.S. police agencies have fewer than twenty five officers. Um, often in the U.S., the the best training programs are found at mid sized agencies that are large enough to have the assets to build and implement large programs or effective training programs, but they're not so big that they can't propagate the effects across an entire workforce. Uh, Mid-sized agencies also, uh, in many communities, have the luxury of stronger community support. So really, it's interesting to see in the U.S., often the training struggles of the biggest departments mirror some of the, the, the challenges we have in the tiniest ones, and it's some of the agencies in the middle that occupy the sweet spot. And I wonder if, you know, when you say that the, some of the larger agencies have the best programs, um, the, the only question I would have to, with that is just from my perspective that a lot of those big agencies are still using a very uh, block training, siloed, nonlinear, traditionalist type of instructional technique, which is really not when we look at motor learning and like you said, adaptive decision-making, those are not the methods that are going to produce those best officers. So even I think in the large agencies, um, when we look at methodology, do you feel that there there's still room for some significant improvement? Absolutely. And Chris, just to clarify, I, you know, I, I think that some of the biggest doesn't mean best. We certainly see some really progressive training programs coming out of very large agencies. Uh, but, uh, you know, as I said, I think often the best training programs and most innovation is coming out of some mid-sized agencies, agencies that have the flexibility, for example, of working with researchers. Uh, it, it's a real mix. A lot of it relates to agency culture. Uh, and I know that some agencies, I know the NYPD, for example, has done a very good job of building an effective firearms program despite the size of the agency. We've seen other very large agencies that do barely any firearms training at all. Uh, at the end of the day, I certainly think the military best illustrates this, there's no reason that police organizations can't implement the same science-driven models of training and education that we see in other high-consequence fields in military aviation and so on. 
And some of those agencies, Dr. Winder, that that have maybe, let's say they've got very progressive evidence-led trainers that are all over this uh, non-linear type of interleaved approach. I've heard feedback from some of them where they've said, well, look, we're just so constrained because post in our state uh, dictates not only the content, but how it's being trained. So even if they want to make those progressive changes, they're limited externally by pressures put on them by post. Do you see that as being also a hurdle that needs to be overcome? Definitely, Chris. And this is, you know, I, I, uh, I've had a number of recent conversations about this very talk, uh, topic about the need for much stronger cross-fertilization between posts and agency training development. Uh, all things being equal, posts have the mandate to implement to implement legislative requirements and standards. They are not necessarily the best source or the most fertile ground for innovation. Uh, so I would really like to see some systematic discussions in the US around how there can be more, as I said, cross-fertilization between what's being developed at agencies working in conjunction with research institutes and universities and the requirements coming out of state legislatures. Uh, and often they're talking past each other. And this, this gets to the, the, the very sensitive topic of the misalignment I have seen for years in police training between what I call uh, questions of human performance and questions of politics. And there's a fundamental misalignment between the two. Simply put, I think one of the reasons American police uh, training is so hamstrung is that time and time again, we try to offer political answers to human performance questions. The two are inseparably related, but they're not identical. And are you finding, are any of those conversations that you're talking about, are they beginning now? Or uh, is there a process underway to, to pave that improvement or what's happening? Uh, I think organizations like IATLAST, to which to which Polis belongs, are well positioned to foster that dialogue. Um, I'd like to see some of that dialogue come out of various programs funded by the United States Department of Justice. But to be frank, I think a lot more has to be done to make that conversation something that will result in an actual evolution of standards. Uh, there are there are some state posts that do a better job than others. I. Um, I want to give a shout out to the state of Oregon. Uh, they have a, a, a very, uh, a really commendable process for incorporating research and science into their standards development. But in much of the U.S., we see a pretty hidebound approach to standards and training, which is beholden to all kinds of political interests that don't necessarily take stock of the science and of what it would really take to advance policing in a way that would satisfy constituencies across the political spectrum. And I appreciate your shout out to Oregon there. And we have previously interviewed Dr. Stacy Utsi from the Center of Policing Excellence mm -hmm. in Oregon. I'd encourage our listeners, uh, if you haven't listened to that interview, to go back and listen to what they've done in the state of Oregon to completely deconstruct the academy and rebuild it based on an evidence-led pedagogical uh, interleaved approach. So uh, one of the, the things that we talked about with police training and 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 how important police trainers are in this process of building trust. I mean, it all starts there, doesn't it? In the academy is you've got uh, very critical players in building that trust culture in your organization as police trainers. So how, how are police trainers selected in the U.S., Jonathan? The short answer is, Chris, it depends. We see agencies that put prospective instructors who are rigor through a rigorous selection process. There are high standards. It's a high hurdle to clear. There are other agencies where the boss comes along and says, tag, you're it. You're a trainer tomorrow morning. And I think pretty much every American cop has had the experience of being trained by someone, whether it's in an in-service training or the academy or in field training by someone who is grudgingly or reluctantly a trainer. Um, that's a recipe for disaster. At best, you get instructors who are apathetic and uh, disinclined to want to give it 100%. At worst, you get people who are angry and bitter and poison the proverbial well. Uh, I can't say it clearly enough in any training program, I don't care if it's in policing or any other profession, the trainer is more important than the training. 
the ability of that trainer to inspire, to build trust, uh, that is far more important than the underlying curriculum. And just to, to talk briefly about some of the work that we did at DARPA, we spent a lot of time talking to different military leadership audiences. We've done this in many other organizational settings as well. As well, We ask leaders at the end of the day, what are your deal breakers? What are the three non-negotiable traits without which you would remove somebody from your organization if you could? And every group we've ever spoken to gives three answers. The words differ, but they all come down to three things. Number one is integrity. Number two is decision-making. Number three is communication. And so what leaders have come to understand in, in much of the military in the U.S. is that teaching specific skills and technical proficiency is ancillary to the greater strategic task of building integrity, building decision-making, and building communication skills. Everything else should be serving that trinity of capacities. The problem in policing is that we often take the reverse approach where we focus on one technical proficiency after another and say, oh, by the way, be honest, see that poster on the wall. Hey, be a good communicator, listen actively. In other words, we, we sometimes reduce to motivational posters what should be really the essence and focus of training. Yeah, right. That that Those values that are on our posters should be evidenced as the very warp and woof of the training culture from start to finish. And, um, you know, with that relationship of trust, do you think that, because we often hear this term psychological safety and the relationship between psychological safety and productive learning environments. Do you think there's, that's a critical role for the, the trainer is to create that environment, that culture in the training academy and in service training where there's a psychological safety for your students? Absolutely. And, and Chris, I'm going to call what you call psychologically, I'm going to call that the freedom to fail, by which I mean good good training. One of the things we learned when we worked, uh, when we had the luxury and, and the, the privilege at DARPA working with some tier one special operations organizations is that the goal of the training is to take people to their point of failure and not to shame them when they reach it, but to say, look, this is as far as you can go. Right. Here's here's the outer limit of your skill. You could try to advance that outer limit. But now, you know, for operational purposes, this is what you can and can't do. The problem with so much police training is that, uh, number one, we don't have a structured evidence based way to to give people the freedom to fail. And number two, uh, rather than the freedom to fail structured into a program which teaches people success, we frighten and shame people. And uh, yeah. When people ask me what I would fix about American policing, I think the two things that are, the two biggest challenges that American policing faces internally are uh, hypervigilance and self righteousness. Uh, and to the first, vigilance is critical. Hypervigilance is dysfunctional. When I le when I left the academy as a baby cop, I was sure that everyone I came across was going to try to attack me with an edge weapon. You're you come out so afraid with such an exaggerated fear of risk. And you also come out having gone through training exercises in which you failed even when you did the right thing. And we don't want to teach people that even if you search the building correctly, even if you do the right thing, someone's going to drop out of the ceiling with, with powdered anthrax, right? We, we develop all these ridiculous scenarios that instill hypervigilance and don't align realistically with the operating environment. And on the matter of self-righteousness, uh, I, I, I like shouting out various agencies. One of my favorite agency mottos is a Washington State Patrol, um, service with humility. Officers need to serve and we need to train officers with humility. So sometimes we have instructors who take a condescending, belittling approach toward recruits. Um, instructors who are humble and can build and gain trust are far more important than the latest piece of gee whiz technology or whatever program of instruction one may be using. I like your term earlier that all those characteristics in a trainer that you spoke about are are primary and the role of actually teaching the skill or the technique is ancillary. I think that's an extremely helpful thing for all trainers to remember what their primary role is. But one of the things that, that I've seen, I wonder if you've seen this across the scope in your research in the U.S. is often trainers are selected not based on those characteristics that you've said are what we need to have, but because 
you know, this guy is a purple belt in judo, or this person is a golden gloves boxer, or this person can shoot the eye out of a rattlesnake. And so we get those high speed, low drag people into training. But, but would you say that that's a problem from the beginning? I think it's a, it's a terrible problem within the training world. And I think it's a, it, it's a fallacy that uh, misdirects a lot of chiefs and sheriffs and leaders in, in selecting the best and brightest folks to be trainers. Uh, you know, by analogy, you don't have to be a world-class heart surgeon to teach CPR, right? I don't care if the swim instructor who teaches my daughters has three Olympic gold medals. Can that instructor teach my little kids to get across the pool safely? The, the problem with a lot of police training is that we wave around the resumes and accomplishments of the trainers without asking the tougher question, which is this, can a random sample of people that instructor trained be put into an unstructured exercise and perform to standard? That tells me a lot more about the training program and its effectiveness than about whether or not uh, the trainer served in this unit or that or has a black belt in one martial art or another. It's the same thing we see in undergraduate education. Uh, you don't need a PhD to teach basic reading, writing, and critical thinking skills. Uh, and I think some of the best and brightest instructors, you know, the, the, the fact the fact that I like to teach people has nothing to do with, with the PhD. The PhD allows me to do, it, it gives me a certain level of skill, but a lot that I do, I did long before I ever had a PhD. And that's interesting because, you know, even if, we just think of our own experience as police officers and as trainers. One of the exercises that I do in the methods of instruction course is I have break them up into groups and I have them come up with, I want you to think back to your training environment, your Academy environment, and, and think of the, the trainer that made the biggest impact, positive impact on you as a police officer and list those characteristics. And when we do that as a group exercise, the thing that we find throughout the whole class is the top seven or eight are all characterological. They're empathy, good communicator, compassionate, um, all of those things that you've mentioned. And then the skills, you know, come down like eighth, ninth, and 10th in the list. And if we even think of our own experience, this is just so common sense that it's it's disappointing that we so easily forget what our, our role should be as trainers. Well, Chris, and you, you've hit on a critical issue that we identified and researched at length, again, back to our DARPA work. Um, not only is it true that people remember those intangible traits of, of empathy, compassion, respect, we found in working with, 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 uh, with different learning groups in the U.S. Army that having instructors who deliberately model those traits not only built those traits in, in the soldiers they trained, they also improved the soldiers' underlying performance and technical skills like marksmanship and land navigation and urban operations. So you might not think at first blush that uh, trust building, empathy, and so forth are conducive to greater technical prowess, but in fact, we found that they are. Right, absolutely. So one of the, the things that's been the I guess the big agenda for the last few years in policing, not only in, in my country here in Canada, but I know in the U S as well has been this big emphasis on uh, cops don't know how to talk to people. We need de-escalation training. We need to teach them how to talk to people. All they want to do is use force. And so uh, there's been millions of dollars spent on de-escalation training, but I, I fear it's been an abject failure in a lot of ways um, and, and I'm wondering what, what, it, what is Polis's perspective on that? Sure. So first of all, I think we need to, need to make a distinction between de-escalation and the narrow technical sense of resolving certain kinds of crises and the wider question of how to talk to people, how to engage people. Uh, as you said, Chris, we have thousands of officers across the U.S., who can't even walk up to a stranger and strike up a simple conversation, let alone negotiate with someone who's psychotic, delusional, and holding a knife. Uh, before I go in any deeper into the weeds, I, I want to hit on the hot button issue here of the, the complete lack of, of, of clarity and consensus in the U.S. around what de-escalation even is. Uh, from my perspective, which is informed to, to a strong degree by medicine, 
De-escalation to me means we, we, we train, lead, and prepare officers and hold them accountable for following what I would basically call the Hippocratic Oath for policing, which is first do no harm. Right. How do we resolve a given situation in a way that's safe, lawful and ethical and causes the least amount of harm, emotional, physical, financial or legal to anyone? Uh, most police encounters can be effectively resolved with no formal law enforcement action. You know, any experienced cop knows that. And most of the time when we arrest people, it's done safely and without any use of force. Even when we do need to use force, um, there are, of course, better and worse ways to do it. What I don't like in the de-escalation debate, back to what I said earlier, is this confusion of politics and human performance. You've got a lot of community members and elected officials running around with a misguided notion that de-escalation means I'm going to do um, everything I can to ever avoid using force. And that de-escalation is a box I have to check before I go to force. Uh, Polis encourages what we think is a more ecologically valid and empirically sound approach, which is, look, in a given situation, de-escalation means I'm going to resolve what's happening in a safe, lawful, and ethical manner. Sometimes that means just walking away, right? Cops need to know there are times and places where I'm going to get in my car, I'm going to say, you know, I... There's nothing I can appear to do for you right now. You know, have a great day. Call me back if you need me. And they just get in the car and they leave. That's one form of de-escalation. Other forms of de-escalation may mean immediate lethal action. And to put this in the context of the, the, the horrific school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, I think that can be understood as a failure to de-escalate. You had hundreds of officers marshaled in and around a school. You had an active assailant shooting children and I would say the failure to close with and neutralize that shooter is a failure to de-escalate. So, but somewhere in between failing to neutralize the active attacker and walking away are countless situations where officers need to have a nuanced approach to when, where, and how they should balance what we call skills of influence and skills of control. And rather than teaching a stepwise approach where we teach officers first de-escalate, then use force, there has to be a, a constant balancing act where we move from one to the other. And just to begin with a very simple example, if I'm teaching a young child right, to cross the street safely, I, I want my daughters to know, here's how you safely cross the street. And I want them to have the autonomy to look and be situationally aware and do the right thing. But if at some point one of my daughters is going to get hurt, I'm going to grab her. I'm going to take, I'm going to use control to keep her from getting hurt. So it's not that I do one or the other. I'm doing both in tandem as the situation merits. Same thing in medicine. If I'm sitting in the doctor's office and my doctor is talking to me about improving my health and fitness, and I suddenly go into cardiac arrest, he's not going to say, well, let's try aspirin. Let's try this. Let's try that. He will immediately move to more aggressive action. And I think the problem is that we have this message flowing from elected officials and leaders and communities that always de-escalate, always de-escalate, meaning talk, 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 talk. So the cows come home and then officers think, OK, I'm going to go through the theatrical process of trying to talk when that doesn't work. I'm going to bop them over the head. Uh, and I think the entire de-escalation debate and process would benefit from a much more patient, science driven conversation about what it is that we're really trying to accomplish and how best to accomplish it. And I wonder if so if I'm hearing you correctly, you're, you're saying that, you know, de-escalation is not something that we do to people as if we have this pixie dust that we we sprinkle the de-escalation pixie dust. And if it works great, it's a de-escalation is a is a system. It's an integrated approach to how we manage potentially violent encounters. And it includes tactics. It includes, like you said, disengagement when that's appropriate um, and even the application of of force when necessary to prevent further escalation. Um, but I'm wondering, like we've seen now several videos, Dr. Wender, where officers have been in these situations where there's clear cues from the subject that they are a cognitive aggressor. In other words, they're calculating, this is criminally minded behavior. This is not a person in crisis. And because of the, the pressure 
and sadly, often internally from agencies and policy and, and directives of you must try to de-escalate, we see officers suddenly uh, either being seriously injured or killed because they're either terrified or they're they're in this nether world of, well, I'm trying de-escalation, but am I done yet because I don't have compliance? And this guy's giving off all kinds of cues that things are going to go badly quickly but officers don't take action. What, what's your thought on that? So first of all, Chris, and you, you, you've hit the nail on the head, we're seeing a lot of research, including the ADAPT surveys we did, suggesting that officers around the country are reluctant to use force. And, and some agencies more than others, but we're certainly seeing a hesitancy and unwillingness to, to put hands on people. And we know from studies such as the, the FBI's LIOCA, law enforcement officers killed and assaulted, we know that the overwhelming majority of lethal confrontations between police and community members begin at a lower level of force. So while it is true, there are always going to be those outlier incidents where officers are suddenly and lethally attacked. For the most part, the, the, the confrontations that lead to death or severe injury begin at a much lower level of force. I also just want to pivot back for a moment to medical analogies uh, and back to what I said about the, 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 the principle of first do no harm. Suppose we have a patient show up in an emergency room with a badly infected limb. What do we do? What does is, what is effective treatment look like? Do we give the person IV antibiotics? Do we amputate the limb? Do we do surgery on the limb? Uh, do we try some alternative medical therapy? Even in, even in the context of, of, of medical science, there's a lot of debate and different practitioners with different training experience might approach that gangrenous limb in different ways, all of them potentially legitimate. The problem in policing is that we politicize everything and then we dilute the very capacity we need in officers to be adaptive decision makers. So you're absolutely right. We have officers who think, well, I talked, I've talked, I've talked, now what do I do? As opposed to teaching officers, here's a dynamic situation what can you do here that is lawful, safe, and ethical to integrate skills of influence and skills of control? What should we do? And it's and the problem is we teach de-escalation as an either or skill. I'm either de-escalating or I'm using force. And if we did that in medicine, we'd see a huge disaster, right? In medicine, we teach that preventative medicine and interventional medicine are not separate. They are inextricably related and they have to be done in tandem. So we tell people brush and floss, but if they get cavities, we fill the cavity. Uh, so it, a dentist is doing prevention. We're trying to encourage health. But I also want to I also want to talk about the healthcare analogy another way. The the advantage that medicine has over policing is that for the most part, people and healthcare providers have an environment of trust. Right? People generally assume if I go to the doctor or the dentist, that person wants what I want. Right? We share a common set of goals. The problem in policing is that we are working in an environment where, where we're needed most is where we're trusted least. So for, for me, for Polis, the most important ingredient in de-escalation is to build trust before conflict. Uh, to pivot to the arena, uh, you know, back to what we, we talked about is trust is safety and safety is trust. In any human relationship, there's conflict, right? In any, their conflict is inevitable part of being human. I don't care if it's husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, parents, and kids, conflict is inevitable. But uh, if you look, for example, at research on conflict you know, in marriage or other environments, the question is not just how couples fight, but how they set conditions for the success of that conflict. So in, po in policing, the reason building community trust is so important is that because conflict is inevitable, the more trust we have, the more money in the bank, as you put it, that we have, the better the officer and the community can weather the conflict because the conflict is going to happen. You know, I remember a fight I had you know, years ago in my police career. It was a gang member I dealt with all the time. Uh, I arrested him. He fought. Um, I took him to jail and he said, hey, you know, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. You know, and I said, hey, you know, it's all right. You know, don't fight next time. We'll call it good. Neither he not, nor I took it personally that he became violent. So the challenge here is not just how do I talk to the guy with a knife? It's how do I build trust one encounter at a time so I'm more likely to get buy-in, I'm more likely to get support, less likely to have hostile bystanders intervene. 
That's excellent. And one that ties into the principles that we do teach on the Four Science De-Escalation course, we talk about pre, uh, pre-suasion, persuasion, and post-suasion. And in both of those, pre, per, and post-suasion is concepts of how do you build trust? How do you leave this situation? How do you leave this person better than when you found them at their worst so that you already are building up a trust relationship, hopefully for your next brother or sister officer who has to encounter that person. So I think that's absolutely critical. Now, in uh, with the escalation training, you you spoke about the, the uh, skills of influence and skills of control. And often, so when we see a failure of that on the street, Dr. Wender, do you think, so if we trace that back to how was de-escalation integrated into the training environment? I mean, what because what I often see is that the training, the de-escalation is this bizarre bolt-on where as long as the executive has a checkbox that they can say, yeah, we teach our members de-escalation and can show it to their police commissions or whatever, uh, it's all good, but uh, it's an absolute siloed, um, bifurcated, bolted on model that's not interleaved with all of those other, like you said, tact and tactics. Um, so do you think that that that's an issue that leads to failure operationally on the street? Silo training and training as political theater and training uh, as liability mitigation are doomed to fail. Uh, and sadly, we see far too much training in American policing, which is number one, it's either it's it's, it's knee jerk crisis driven political theater, right? Something bad happens. So every chief and sheriff runs to show that, hey, we're, we, we did training X. The guys went to their eight hours. So we're good. Um, or we see liability mitigation. One of the questions I, I, I love to ask police, police chiefs and sheriffs is this. Um, if, if your worst officers pass every year all their check-the-box policy compliance tests, if that testing neither predicts nor prevents catastrophic failure, what is its value other than as theater? Uh, and I expect if you take any of the officers involved in some of these horrific failures and you pick whatever city you want, I would bet you a tidy sum of money that they all pass the online check the box training in a vacuum. Even the most incompetent officer knows what box to check. Uh, as far as training programs. So number one, the silo issue is huge as you already hit upon. Number two, something we tell agencies all the time, there is no program of instruction. I don't care if it's the curriculum, you know, from four science, if it's T3, if it's anything else out there, if it's not implemented, in a sustainable manner, it is doomed to fail. It, you know, the one and done model will always fail because in whether it's policing or any other domain of practice, a single transient or rare dose of training just won't impact behavior. It can't. Uh, and I think we, we have a lot of police trainers and training vendors who cling to this illusion that you know eight hours of training once a year or once every five years will change things it won't it can't uh, and this raises all kinds of questions about what sustainable effective training looks like uh, it also creates a whole raft of questions about how to make the best of limited resources um, i think a lot of departments run out and buy the latest and greatest technology without thinking about how they will actually implement it? What will they do with it? Uh, Reality-based training is great, but if it's infrequent and poorly structured and poorly coached, it's not going to work. Uh, so there's a, a host of questions here around dosing, frequency, instructor quality, all of which I think are at the heart of thinking through what really good police training could and should look like. Right. And I'm glad you mentioned that. And I reflect on uh, Gordon Graham over at Lexapol. He he uses the phrase of solid, realistic, verifiable, ongoing training, and that every day is a training day. And so these critical principles shouldn't just be the days when we get everybody together in a room or we can teach them or on the mats is uh, trainers and agencies should look at how can they embed these these critical principles and characteristics every day as part of a strategic um, strategically designed training program in their agency. And Chris, sort of a related point. I don't think anybody, least of all you or me, would debate the value of well-orchestrated, well-designed, data-driven, reality-based training. There is clear value in that. 
However, uh, many police trainers and police executives fall prey to the fallacy that realism equals effectiveness. Uh, and in fact, we know that many of the, the core cognitive and perceptual skills inherent to good adaptive decision making can be learned with simple paper and pencil exercises. Uh, and so the, the fact that you've invested a quarter million dollars in some immersive simulator doesn't by itself mean your cops are going to be better decision makers. I also think this is where we need to think very carefully about how to deploy science and best practices in the growing implementation of technology like AR and VR, which like every other new technology people are looking to to have magic effects. And I'll tell you right here on the record, it can't and it won't. Not without structured implementation into a, a, a training program that's appropriately developed and tracked. But technology by itself cannot and will not solve the problems of American policing. Right. And those technologies, as helpful as they may be, are only helpful to the extent of the quality and character of the trainers that are using them. Because again, it all comes down to well, how are you using that information to impart adaptive decision-making skills to your people? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I, and at the end of the day, look, I, um, I, I see and know know the value in good training technology. I'm I'm a big advocate for the effective use of training technology, but um, given the choice between one repetition a year and a quarter million dollar simulator, and an instructor taking officers more frequently to an old gravel pit with a really good program of instruction, I'll take the gravel pit over the simulator any day. Right, right. So now let's get to the ADAPT report. You've mentioned it a couple times. So in March of 2022, Polis published the ADAPT report, which was titled The Current State of Police Control and Defensive Tactics Training. So can you briefly tell us, like, what was what was the methodology that you and your colleagues used to examine that particular issue with regards to police training? Sure. So just, uh, for, uh, just a couple of seconds about the genesis of the ADAPT program. Uh, the U.S. Department of Justice, under what's called the Valor Officer Safety and Wellness Initiative, um, wisely decided that they needed to invest some money into going back to the drawing board with use of force training. Uh, so Polis had the honor of winning a solicitation, which tasked us with the responsibility of looking at research around the globe on use of force training, police training, military training, private security, uh, academic research on everything from kinesiology to decision-making psychology. And basically trying to understand from the ground up, what does it really take to teach officers to make good use of force decisions? Not just to be technically proficient, but to actually teach, or to actually teach them in a way that will result in good decisions by which I mean safe, legal, and ethical. Uh, so as part of the ADAPT program, we created two national, we created two surveys, or actually international, we actually had some good feedback from Canada uh, and a number of other countries. We surveyed line officers and we surveyed instructors asking about their current training, what it covered, what it didn't cover, and how their training aligned or not with what they were seeing in the field. We also wrote, as you said, we wrote a, uh, I, I would hope people would find to be a fairly exhaustive research report pulling together everything we could find literally from around the world and trying to answer the question, what should use of force training look like? How should it be built? How should it be structured? Uh, what are the what are the promising practices to follow? What are the pitfalls to avoid? Okay. And so in that report, uh, I've read it thoroughly, digested it. And by the way, I would recommend after this interview for our listeners that you uh, can find it easily by Googling just the ADAPT report. Again, the title of that is The Current State of Police Control and Defensive Tactics Training. So the report published uh, 20 recommendations. You came out strongly with 20 uh, recommendations, but in the time that we have, why don't let's just take, say, the top three, Dr. Winder. If you were to have an elevator story and give us your top three recommendations, if that's even possible, out of the 20, what would they be? Sure. So th the easiest way to explain the ADAPT program in, in one phrase, it's my first recommendation, is teach situations, not techniques. And that simply means when we teach use of force decision making, use of force skills, we need to begin from day one of the academy by forcing officers to think holistically about the situations they're most likely to encounter on the street. 
And I'm going to go back to an analogy that everybody can remember from school. With little kids, art skills are tied to a project. Nobody says, here's how to use glue. Here's how to use scissors. Here's how to use a crayon. We say, hey, uh, draw a picture and take it home to your parents. And kids figure out how to make different things, pulling together different skills. So day one in the academy, rather than saying, here's how to use handcuffs. Here's pepper spray. Here's a gun. Here's a baton. Here's how to talk. We should say, okay. That guy over there just shoplifted a bottle of beer. He's walking away. He's ignoring commands. Go. And along the way, we should layer on what one of our mentors, Anders Erickson, calls just-in-time information. I obviously don't expect a recruit day one in the academy to have the legal and operational and tactical knowledge to completely resolve that situation. But that person's instincts were good enough to get a police job. And there, there's enough raw material there that we can guide people and force them to make those adaptive decisions. So that's number one, teach situations, not techniques. Number two, the core of police use of force training and all police training for that matter should be adaptive decision-making. More than anything else, the hallmark of expertise in any high consequence profession, I don't care if it's medicine, aviation, military, nuclear plant operations is adaptive decision-making. If we are not preparing and expecting and leading and evaluating officers for their capacity to be adaptive decision makers, we are setting ourselves up and communities up for failure. Uh, third, we need to build all training around a positive mindset. We need to teach officers what it takes to succeed. We need to identify and replicate patterns of success rather than focus myopically on rare catastrophic failures. I talked earlier about giving officers the freedom to fail. It means showing them what their limits are physically, cognitively, and, and so on. But that needs to happen in a context where the resounding message is, you can do this. You can succeed. You can go home alive. You can get this right. And time and time again, the paradigm of police training is shame on you. You're going to die. You're going to be killed. This guy got sued. This guy ended up in prison. Don't let it be you. Uh, we can't teach success by only focusing on failure. So we certainly can and should look at the failures and how they occurred and how most of them could and should have been prevented, but we need to look overwhelmingly at patterns of success and how we can replicate those and strengthen them systematically. That's really what ADAPT is about in a nutshell. Right, okay. So if, if I could just maybe get you to expand a little bit on decision-making and adaptive decision-making, because I can hear trainers already saying, well, yeah, we do that already in the academy. Uh, the last two weeks in the academy is all scenarios and all this. And so they've had recruits that have spent months in a very linear, uh, uh, non-decision-making environment and then thrust them at the end of it. Now we're, we're, we're going to try to bring all those Scott silos together in these scenarios at the end. And then often we see some very poor performance because when I think of adaptive decision-making, I'm thinking like it's out of the gate day one in the academy where we build in a very scaffolded and strategic and careful way, but we are using all kinds of short drills, uh, technique-based stuff where even our officers are having to read to extract cues. So we always want them having to make decisions in everything that they do, because I think we don't want trainers thinking that the decision-making piece is, is like the escalation. It's now we're in the decision-making part of the academy. Uh, don't you think it should be like, again, embedded throughout the entire scope of training? So Chris, I, I, you, you hit the nail on the head, especially with your last comment, which is that we, time again, we see academies turn decision-making, as you said, either into an ancillary lecture toward the end of training or it's a poster on the wall showing decision-making model X or Y. What we're talking about here is not whether or not you want to use decision-making model X or Y. It's not, um, it, it's not five hours on decision-making on the last week of the academy. It is beginning day one with an immersive, cognitive, affective, and physical experience that encourages and fosters adaptive decision-making. And I want to be clear here, uh, when I talk about adaptive decision-making, we're talking about a vast body of scientific research that crosses many different fields from aviation and medicine to sports and policing. So there's no product here I'm trying to sell. This is something that any agency can do uh, by looking at open source research. And I think the problem is we see various decision-making models being marketed and sold that are really nothing more than, they're, they're abstract, they're not what we're talking about here 
what we're talking about here are habits of mind and performance that we know from decades of research can and do make a difference in fostering expertise. Uh, and to offer a very simple exercise, this is something people can do with little kids, right? This is, I, I, in fact, I'm gonna, I was reading an article about this earlier today. Too much police training looks like helicopter parenting, where instead of telling a child, what do you think you should do? How would you solve the problem? We hover over in police training and we, we say, well, follow the script, say this phrase, go here, go there, follow the yellow footprints. And all that that does, it does two things. Number one, it disempowers people. Number two, it weakens their capacity to be adaptive, creative thinkers. And number three, it signals mistrust. Um, and none of that gets us where we need to go. And just, again, to take a very simple, uh, one of my pet peeves that goes back, again, to early childhood physical skills education. Think of how many videos you've seen of officers who literally run backwards in a straight line, sometimes at the loss of their own life, because we've taught them on a range, we've taken away that skill of lateral movement that little children learn, right? Little kids know by the age of, of, of four, five, or six, if I run backwards in a straight line, I'm gonna fall on my butt and get hurt. So they learn, oh, I'm gonna move sideways. But yet time and again, we see officers who literally can't move diagonally or in a non-linear way. And I think that failure to move all, uh, in a nonlinear way is exactly an indication of what's happening in their heads, which is that we hammer in scripts, memorize this, do this, here's a policy, here's a procedure, memorize this set of steps. That is the opposite of what we should be doing. And back to where this conversation began, Chris, this approach to training requires trust. It requires elected officials who trust their police leadership. It requires police leadership who trust their supervisors and subordinates and instructors. It requires instructors who trust their students and, and students who trust their instructors. And it requires a community that believes all this is being done in a data-driven, honest way. So uh, really what we're talking about here is packaging of trust and science in an operationally and ethically sound way. Easier said than done, but eminently within reach. Right. Absolutely. And then your third point, uh, Dr. Winder, around instilling a positive mindset. And I'm envisioning a clear connection here between the importance of that. And again, going back to training. And uh, if you, as you said earlier, having a safe environment to fail in. And so even looking at those mistakes and errors in training. And so rather than than having a fear of punishment or a fear of failure is looking at all of those as affordances for opportunities to be successful. If that's the culture that's richly embedded in training, then do you think that that will help result in officers who have that instilled that positive mindset on the street? Absolutely. I think back to what I said about self-righteousness and the, this reluctance to look ourselves in the mirror. Uh, imagine a winning sports team. Imagine a, a coach coming to a sports team and saying, look, um, I know we lost the game, but I'm not here to judge. We're going to watch another team's loss because I don't want to talk about you guys. We, we don't want to talk about why we lost the game. We're going to look at another team. We have to have the courage and the integrity to look at our own performance. And I would love to get rid of the phrase in American policing. Of, well, I don't want a Monday court morning quarter. Well, I wasn't there. Well, look, it, it, it's a truism that you weren't there. But I think it's it's morally and scientifically and tactically, tactically dishonest to say that as officers, we can't look at each other's performance and identify strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and just because an officer didn't get things right, we're not condemning them to the hellfire, but we are saying these are things that you could and should have done differently. And if we don't have the integrity to say that, then uh, that only weakens our position and increases the likelihood that external political forces will squeeze on us. We have to be able to look forward. Um, and that means unflinching self-examination guided by science and guided by a success-driven mindset. That is excellent. Thank you. And that, I think, is a great way to conclude our interview. But I want to give you a minute, uh, Dr. Winder. Is there anything that you wished I would have asked you or a comment that you want to get out to our listeners? No, Chris, I don't think so. You, you did a great job of, of guiding the conversation. Uh, my, my only suggestion that, that I don't, don't think we touched on is um, trying not just create, to create environments where we're having posts, for example, talk to agencies, but um, helping agencies and elected officials have stronger dialogues around what it really takes to improve policing. Um, 
I think a lot of benefit could come from engaging communities, especially uh, civil rights organizations, groups that are skeptical and mistrustful of policing, and, and helping educate them about what it would really take to give people the quality of policing that they deserve. The most basic human right is safety. And people who live in poor, marginalized communities have no less entitlement to safety than people who are rich. And so I think that if, if police trainers and executives could come together with some of their strongest critics and find common cause around what training could and should look like and what it would take to do that, I think that could be a powerful force for the good. That's amazing. Thank you for that. And uh, Dr. Wender, if our listeners wanted to reach out to you, if they had questions, if they wanted to follow up on any of the content, what is the best way for them to get in touch with you? Uh, people can just Google Polis Solutions or just my name. Uh, I, there's an, an info email address or you can email me directly at Polis Solutions. And we, we love hearing from people around the world. Uh, every conversation like this teaches me more. So uh, the modernization and, and reform of policing, is a, it's a team sport. And the, the more conversations we have, the more voices we in, the more good we can do. And I, Chris, I really am grateful to you for the opportunity to have this conversation. I look forward to talking more and to hearing hopefully from some of the folks in your audience. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And more importantly, thank you what for what you and your colleagues at Polis do to help advance public safety and, and policing practices. And uh, we're excited to see what's going to come out with uh, T3 TAC, Tactics and Trust next out of Polis. So we'll look forward to that. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Winder. Thanks, Chris. Be safe.